evidence of God's behavior modifying grace seen in somebody builds confidence in that person. It's a person of grace. Now you can work that out in all sorts of ways. That makes you a rock because they're not dependent on anything you are or can do or will do. Right? They're depending on, on the God who can. That makes you a rock. And frankly, dealing with guys around me, you know I deal with some pretty hard cases, don't I? You know, <laughs> you know what I said about I get the opportunity and the privilege to deal with some very interesting people. Right? They are looking for men who can be rocks into whose shadow they come. If they can come into the shadow of a rock, they're looking for rocks to rise up. They're really, really not looking for what they so often think they see in the Church of God. They're looking for guys who are rocks because they're family on the rock. You can be confident in a guy like that. And Paul's going to have confidence in a guy like that because he's going to be looking at God for everything. And that's going to be okay. When people become independent and self-sufficient and think there's something about themselves, they're not guys you can rely on because they're not looking in the right place for the strength they're going to need. Paul says, I'm confident about you, Philemon. I'm confident about you. You can have confidence in the community of God's people when we all live consciously dependent on His grace, not what we can achieve. Is that making sense in English? Have I flogged this horse to death? Flog it again. It's an important one. It destroys confidence when believers are living with guilt, not with grace. It destroys confidence. The way people behave towards one another is poor when they're overburdened with guilt. There is therefore now no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus who are called according to his purpose. You can be confident in a person who's not living with guilt anymore because it's pinned on the cross with Jesus. You can't be confident in the responses of what you're going to get from people who are living with a lot of guilt on them. Grace builds confidence in people. Guilt destroys our responses to one another. Guilt hampers our decision making. It wrong puts our choices, our priorities. It wrong puts our prayers. You can have confidence in the people of grace. And they can afford, they are the people who can afford to be calm and at peace because they're relying on God and He's reliable. They can afford to be merciful and accepting and forgiving because they know we only get by on the mercies of God day by day. We can afford to be forgiving and accepting because but for the grace of God, what will I be doing? They're changed people because love, because mercy changes people's hearts. Something that crime and law and punishment alone. You can be confident in fellowship with the people of grace. I'm confident, says Paul, that reflection on the reality of God's grace in your life and the reality of the change that grace creates in you, that you're now going to respond to my appeals to you on the basis of grace, Philemon, to be gracious in receiving back this brother who previously has wronged you. How much trouble is causing in churches for guys? For women? Because we're not receiving back those who What's the gospel about? We'll see that comes up in the team in a minute. That is an important principle. Receiving back people who've wronged you. You can be confident in fellowship with such people. And I am confident, says Paul, that the reality of God's grace in your life, thinking that through, the reality of the change that God creates in you, come on. The lesson is receiving back in a way that glorifies and makes famous in your area, in all your acquaintances, the glories and the grace of our God. Show your grace in dealing with Him, and people will see grace. Confident you're going to do this. And, and here's the second thing to notice about this verse here. Since I'm confident in your obedience, I'm writing to you, knowing that you'll do even more than I say. That's what grace does. This is very, very basic Christian discipleship stuff. It's the first lesson. Grace doesn't just travel one mile. Grace doesn't just travel one mile. What do I mean by that? Here's what Jesus says in his basic formulation of what constitutes the character, the personality, the way we do things amongst the community of people who've been saved by grace. Where does he write that down for us? He writes that down for us in Matthew 5 through 7. He writes that down in the Sermon on the Mount. And here's what he says about it. Here's what it means to live by grace through faith alone. <coughs> you 
further did you say, life for I am tooth for a tooth? Yeah, Moses said that, it's in the law, it's the absolute, it's the highest level of biblical revelation, says his audience as he cites this verse. But I tell you, oh, Jesus has taken to himself the authority to speak as God. Moses is coming as the lawgiver, Jesus is coming as the giver of the new covenant. I tell you, do not resist an evil person. How does that sound? Jesus is hanging on a cross. What's he doing? Is he resisting an evil person? He's not resisting an evil person. As a lamb was led to the slaughter, so comes Jesus. Here's an important aspect of what it means to live by grace through faith alone. Here's what it means to live by grace through faith alone. To live changed by the overwhelming grace of God. The grace of God went to the undeserved uttermost so that we could be set free for glory. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other cheek also. That's what it means not to resist an evil person. If anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, hand over your coat as well. If anyone forces you to go one mile, to begin that, go with them another mile, go with them two miles. Give to the one who asks you, do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. We heard what we were said in the old covenant, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, but we've got this covenant of grace, and I tell you, with that covenant, don't resist an evil person. Do not resist an evil person. And then he applies that basic fundamental principle. In the case of absolute personal affront, in this case a slap in the face, he applies that in the case of a legal challenge, sued for the shirt off your back. He applies that in the case of the Roman soldier, the legionary, on the, on the long march, who exercises the oppressive Roman legal right to compel one of the subject peoples of the empire to carry his backpack for him for one while to give him a rest on his long march. Don't do that. Do two. God's lavish grace affects you that way. It's changed us by not giving us what we deserve, but paying the price, bearing the cost, so that he takes what we deserve, we get what he deserves. What the eminent theologian Mona D. Hooker, that's her name, I kid you not, Mona D. Hooker, she calls interchanging. We have been overabundantly blessed when we deserve to be abundantly condemned. How does that change your mind? That's just bound to affect you. So where, where, where's living in God's grace going to take us then? Come on, Philemon, come on. This Onesimus has come back. Where's this grace going to take you? I'm confident you are reading this. I'm writing to you, knowing you will be even more than I said when I said, take him back. As a brother. He's wronged you. He's offended you. He's taken you back as a brother. Even more than I say, you can imagine. Paul hasn't specified what he wants. <laughs> so all the commentaries go through lots of ink. Right? About what it is that Paul actually wants. Well, he wants. He wants grace to be shown. He's not going to specify. It's grace. And you're showing grace back. If he specifies, it's not grace coming back, is it? It's what comes out of the overflowing abundance of your heart. And a gratitude to God for what he's done. See, I said right back at the beginning, this book is not about <coughs> manumission, the setting free of slaves, and the abolition of slavery. Paul isn't asking for the setting free of a slave. He's asking for so much more. He's saying, take this guy as your brother. Because that's what God's made him. By grace is your brother. Paul doesn't make an issue of Paul, of Philemon returning an Esmus to Paul, to be Paul's helper in the mission centered around Paul's prison cell in Rome. He drops a pretty big hint in verse 13, I'd like to keep him with me so he can take your place in helping me while I'm in chains for the gospel. That would be nice. <laughs> but I didn't want to do anything without your consent, so I'm sending it back. Who knows God knows what I'm do. He points to the general principle. He leaves Philemon to work out what it means confident that enjoying the luxury of God's grace has so changed, it's been such a life changer for Philemon that Philemon is surely going to go more than a mile here 
And again, it's a window opened on the way this church and these people are shot through with grace. And the reality of the work of grace in these guys, it builds confidence in Paul about Philemon. 